The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is Michael Volkoff, and we're here for the webinar on 2020 Mid-Year OFAC Enforcement Review. Um, <clears throat> there should be two handouts, one uh, that are available to you. One is the uh, slides, and then we also prepared for our clients and colleagues a uh, sanctions uh, sort of cheat sheet. It's a one-page uh, summary of that. So I want to make sure uh, that if you can't download it, just uh, send me an email uh, at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com and we'll send you a set of the slides uh, as well. Uh, I want to make sure everybody can hear me uh, okay. If there are any problems, please let me know. Um, we'll try to address any questions that come in, um, you know, as we're going along, but, uh, you know, no guarantees on that. Um, in terms of we have a lot of slides to to go through uh, today. Well, hope everybody's uh, staying healthy, safe. Uh, it's a really tough time. Uh, you know, the pandemic seems to be going on unabated. Uh, and hope your family, friends, everybody's staying safe and healthy, your colleagues. Um, just incredible stories to hear. Um uh, you know, of courage, uh, grief, and suffering. It's really just, it, it breaks your heart. Uh, and we're grateful to all the people who are helping us to stay safe and healthy, uh, first responders, healthcare professionals, public health officials. Uh, you know, we're, uh, it's a time for gratitude and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, they, they can feel the gratitude that we have towards it. Anyway, so um, again, uh, Let's uh, let's get on to you know sanctions enforcement, and uh, I have a couple observations sort of at the beginning, but I'll give you a summary of where we are, and then uh, some sort of interesting statements that have been made about sanctions enforcement, uh, and then we can uh, you know go from there. Um, I really it, it's a it's an interesting time, uh, like I said, and. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, trying to operate an enforcement system through the pandemic is pretty weird. Uh, the COVID has had a dramatic impact on uh, OFAC enforcement, uh, no question about that, and um, for the first half of the year. And what's clear is now we're starting to see a return to uh, OFAC's sort of prior aggressive enforcement. We've had three enforcement actions in the last three weeks. Uh, a total of seven for the year, only approximately $11 million. Um, interestingly, we saw the first corporate enforcement action and the first corporate enforcement action for violation of the North Korea sanctions program. We're going to talk about that case because there's a lot of interesting aspects to that. Uh, and we also saw the first appearance of the Justice Department under its new uh, corporate enforcement program for export control violations and sanctions violations. So uh, this to me is, is kind of interesting uh, as well. Uh, so let's uh, let's. Here's a, a bar graph that uh, I've added for 2020, at least, where we are uh, with seven enforcement actions. You can see it's quite a tail off from 26 or so from 2019, but uh, uh, it's understandable given the pandemic and what's going on with the pandemic. So um, I would expect that we would see much more of that. Uh, Total fines, uh, and you'll see a minuscule, if you look real close with a magnifying glass for 2020, you'll see a minuscule, minuscule uh, $11 million. Um, and obviously, we've had no b big blockbuster cases that have come along. Look at 2019, uh, you know, which was in the uh, billions. So um, the initial observation I wanted to make is I, I kind of feel like OFAC owes us a little bit more of an explanation uh, in terms of what is going on with uh, their expectations. And let me go through why. 
Uh, I kind of feel like they, uh, this, this was the best uh, sort of image I could find for speaking out of both sides of one's mouth. But it kind of leaves you with, okay, so what do you want us to do? What's the expectation here? And here's the reason why I say that. In around April, or it may have been even March, uh, OFAC put out a notice or a guidance on reassigning compliance rate resources. And they said, based on a risk-based assessment or reassessment in the pandemic era, if you need to reassign resources, meaning if you have to cut down your resources, if you have to uh, make sure that you um, cover your sort of highest risk candidates, but we're going to sort of tr relax our expectations with regard to uh, sanctions uh, enforcement and compliance in the pandemic. Well, I think that was a great forward-looking thought because obviously we had employee furloughs, we had illnesses, we had a lot of things that hit a lot of companies and everybody working remotely to the extent they did work. Uh, the problem that I had with this is that in the next month uh, of May, for example, this is what we got. A Treasury, State Department, and Coast Guard advisory on deceptive shipping practices, which was a lengthy document which imposed new compliance uh, new compliance expectations over the growing frustration over actors who were circumventing Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela, and put, expecting compliance officers to take appropriate steps to monitor their supply chain and other high-risk activities. So if you've seen that document, which you can get off my uh, blog, uh, we wrote about it. Um, it's a lengthy expectation to take a look at vessels that are used in your um, process, in your supply chain, to make sure you're not uh, allowing people to circumvent the process uh, or circumvent the sanctions. Now, obviously, it applies most particularly to anybody that's in commodities, uh, energy, or any of those types of industries. But nonetheless, it was, to me, it was kind of a, a way of, of speaking out of both sides of your mouth. So let me go back on this. And I want to say again, so on the one hand, we have this one statement here with regard to OFAC uh, sanctions. We also, by the way, had some warning signs coming out of the Commerce Department with regard to EAR and ITAR, with regard to licensing requirements there, and uh, to remind everybody that video sharing could be a deemed export. So at the one hand, we're hearing, look, be careful, be careful. On the other hand, we're saying they're saying, go ahead and reassign some resources. We understand it's the pandemic. And uh, that I kind of feel like that that put us all in a position of, you know, what are we uh, trying to do here? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, and uh, how are we going to get this done? So I, in some respects, I feel like uh, OFAC needs a little bit of an explanation uh, and is this guidance that you know they gave out before in April, does it not really apply anymore uh, with regard to their expectations? But let's go back to the vessel screening and the due diligence, because this advisory to me on deceptive shipping practices, and uh, this was related to the controversy with regard to oil and gas being shipped to and from Venezuela and the use of Iranian ships uh, to do that and Iranian oil. And the Chinese also were involved in circumventing the sanctions as well as the Russians who had a lot of who have a lot of investments uh, in uh, Venezuela. So um, this uh, notice that came out, there's a good it's good and worth reading because it has a lot of good um, sort of best practices and the advisory again, if you're involved in any of these commodity industries, it was very, uh, very helpful. But also the expectations rose with regard to due diligence requirements and uh, looking at your supply chain all the way down to who owns the vessel. So you can imagine uh, in your supply chain, if like four or five layers down, you all of a sudden have uh, uh, you all of a sudden have, you know, these uh, um, beneficial owners who may be prohibited. 
we basically are now having to go through and make sure our supply chain, if we have these kinds of vessels, that we do have the beneficial ownership information. And then we also have to look at the use of vessels to the extent we get, say, items from China or whatever, that they don't transit through a sanctioned country. So, for example, if the boat stops off and uh, in an Iranian harbor, and then there is some, uh, you know, activity that goes on. All of a sudden, uh, you're on the hook for an illegal transport through uh, Iran. Um, there also are they, they also emphasize uh, contractual certifications uh, that are included in your uh, contracts, as well as uh, ship to ship transfers, which is basically one of the primary ways that you get around or you try to disguise transactions is try to do them in the middle of the ocean with a ship to ship type of transfer. So those are the kinds of things that um, you want to be sh uh, be sure of. I want to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. Uh, if somebody can let me know, because I'm not getting uh, I do I want to make sure everybody can uh, do that if somebody okay, great. Thank you very much. Just got a a okay. Anyway, so, um, so then what also has occurred lately with the OFAC has been the designation of vessels to block uh, the Maduro regime. In other words, we've seen a number of vessels owned by Greek companies uh, that were designated uh, by OFAC. And remember, OFAC has a pretty broad designation of power, and they uh, designated a whole bunch of. Uh, vessels. So we have to make sure that, again, we, uh, when checking our vessels or our supply chain, that we have um, uh, made sure that we uh, have run and screened and made and verified the ownership of these vessels to make sure there are no prohibited persons. Um, and it's important to do that uh, to make sure that we um, uh, you know, are in full compliance and that we document it. The other thing that happened, which I think is really uh, interesting, uh, and it's a little nerve wracking, is that DOJ, the Justice Department, stepped in and um, basically forfeited several vessels for carrying oil and gas cargo bound for Venezuela. And it, basically, there was a covert network of ship-to-ship -ship transfers that ultimately worked its way back to the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is a foreign terror, designated foreign terrorist organization. And uh, DOJ got a seizure order. And uh, the interesting thing will be, will they start to try to seize these uh, vehicles are the vessels, where are they going to try to do that? Are they going to wait for them to come into a port and seize them? But whatever it is, this is the last thing we want is to be, you know, have any cargo being carried by, carried by a seized vessel, not to say we would ever be do, engaged in illegal transactions, but we want to make sure we're not on a vessel that is including those types of uh, materials, which then can be seized by the government. And the last thing we need is to have our some of our cargo on the same ship. Nonetheless, uh, this was an aggressive action by the Justice Department. Uh, and I think with regard to uh, Venezuela, it's going to uh, continue um, until they can, you know, uh, put more pressure on the uh, Maduro regime. Okay, so let's go to some of the significant cases. And we definitely had some interesting cases here with principles that we need to talk about with regard to OFAC. And then at the end, I want to uh, just bring up some things that are going on at commerce as well with regard to the Chinese. Um, so here's a list of the cases that we had. As I mentioned, we had seven cases, and I want to go through uh, each of them just to talk a little bit about them and uh, some of the lessons learned and some uh, important uh, aspects of those uh, cases so that you can sort of apply the same principles uh, in your own work with regard to OFAC. The first case was uh, Isentra FCE. This is a, it's actually, it actually goes back to a parent company at the UK. And uh, this was the first case uh, we had of a corporate enforcement action under the North Korea sanctions program. It also was the first appearance uh, this year with DOJ, uh, and DOJ took control of this case in the sense of they entered into a deferred prosecution agreement, and uh, DOJ and OFAC agreed to a settlement with uh, Accentra for $665,000, uh, 
for violations of the North Korea sanctions. Now, Essentra is basically a cigarette uh, filter maker, um, and the, con- the contract occurred and all of the activity occurred outside the United States, except for uh, the payments when were made in U.S. dollars and also made to a foreign branch of a U.S. bank. Uh, and uh, what was really interesting, if you go through the case, is the they have detailed emails, they have detailed uh, analysis of the shipping and transaction documents, and then the intent here was clearly to ultimately get these cigarette filters to a manufacturer uh, in North Korea, but it was done through China. And it was done primarily through a pretty elaborate network of front companies and shell companies in China and actually outside of China uh, that ultimately led back to North Korea. But the fundamental point was that there was um, there was also uh, false documentation at the very last step. So you're always going to have to have some kind of cover up of where this where the uh, transaction ultimately is going, and that occurred with the last step between China and uh, East, uh, the ultimate buyer in North Korea. But getting to that point were shell companies, uh, and a, it's kind of a web of shell companies and front companies that were used. And then they had ultimately disguised shipping and transaction documents where they changed all the North Korean entries to Chinese, uh, in other words, to China locations, uh, noticeably close to North Korea, but nonetheless China companies. And that underscores the point to me that I always make with regard to uh, looking at your risks is if you are in geographic areas that are close to a prohibited country, like uh, if you're in China near North Korea, you're going to re- you're going to increase your risks uh, that there could be some activity related to North Korea to cross the border or whatever or sourcing of inf- uh, of supplies, or you're going to distribute your product ultimately through a distributor in China or a customer in China who ultimately is going to distribute it to uh, North Korea. So th- this is a. a w- one point with regard to Accentra. The second point is beneficial ownership, beneficial ownership, beneficial ownership. On high risk type of transactions like this in China, you have to know everybody involved in the transaction. You have to know who is involved and you have to know who owns the companies uh, because that's going to help you. So let's go back because to me, I want to remind everybody again that last year the Justice Department put out its new corporate enforcement policy, and obviously the Justice Department got involved here with regard to the Accentra case. And the corporate enforcement policy to me uh, raised a number of issues with regard to increasing potential criminal liability because what it means is if you're going to do a voluntary disclosure to uh, OFAC with regard to a violation or potential violation, um, you have to seriously consider whether or not there's criminal uh, liability. And if so, then you have to, uh, if there is some evidence to that it was a willful knowing violation of the sanctions, not the specific sanctions, but that it was an illegal activity, uh, you should voluntarily disclose that uh, to, to try to get uh, you know, clearance or declination or, or non-prosecution agreement with regard to this uh, issue. So I wanted to remind everybody about that. And uh, what I had mentioned before is that there will be, and I expect an increase in potential criminal sanctions cases, but at least there's going to be disclosures that they're going to be more involved in these disclosures. And here, this case with the Accentra case is a perfect example of what I mean. It's clear there was a disclosure to DOJ because of willful violations, and it was intentional. When you look at the evidence, they clearly knew what they were doing, and they knew what they were trying to circumvent the North Korea sanctions. Uh, And so Accentra gets a deferred prosecution agreement, so no criminal prosecution. There may be prosecutions, though, of the individuals against whom uh, the company may cooperate against. But remember, now that we, when you see DOJ involved, 
uh, in some respect, either a declination here, a deferred prosecution agreement, that basically what you know at that point is that there was a disclosure that may have been made to DOJ as well as OFAC under this new uh, policy. So my favorite case, uh, just because uh, it underscores again, uh, large companies with lots of money, uh, like Amazon, like Apple, which I'm going to remind everybody uh, in a minute about, it are basically if they they basically had screening errors of a fundamental nature, which I mean it's just incredible to me. Amazon and Apple are the two biggest companies in the world, and yet they don't have a compliance program for OFAC that works in a way to avoid screening errors. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. So here, Amazon settles with OFAC for $134,000. Now, it's clear that their cooperation and remediation was pretty extraordinary, uh, even though the violations that we're talking about only totaled uh, up to $269,000. Dollars, But they basically violated the – for a seven-year period, they violated the Crimea restrictions, which came in in 2014-2015, Iranian and Syria sanctions, as well as numerous other sanctions programs. They provided uh, goods and services to – or goods. They were sending you know, their low-level retail, low-value retail goods to uh, personnel at foreign – Embassies. So the Iranian embassy people from foreign you know, that are located in another country were reporting on Amazon and putting down as their an address the Iran embassy. Uh, and uh, we all they also violated reporting obligations that they had. It's not under the crime wind down license. Sorry for that typo. It's Crimea wind down license, uh, totaling two hundred sixty nine thousand. So they had hundreds of errors relating to the names of SDNs uh, and uh, errors such as what I love is Yalta, Crimea. They put in the system accidentally Yalta, which is a city in Crimea, obviously, and they misspell Crimea with a K. And guess what? The screening didn't work. And uh, the screening didn't flag uh, and we had hundreds of transactions like this, uh, although they only totaled 269000 What does that tell you about Amazon screenings uh, system? I mean, it's just as unbelievable. Now, of course, they on remediation, they had to go to overkill, and they have tons and tons of remediation. And maybe now they have a program that they should have had before. But this is just incredible that Amazon... And, and I imagine this, the fine here of $134,000 is going to be like a na nanosecond of their time uh, so um, and their revenues. So let's remember, though, the Apple case, just to rub it in on the tech sector here. Last year, Apple paid OFAC $467,000 for violations of the foreign narcotics kingpin. They started dealing with this massive drug dealer who was uh, based in Slovenia uh, and had been designated as a massive drug dealer. And they entered into an app development agreement with SIS. Uh, and this company had been designated under the SDN list uh, for drug trafficking. And uh, Apple's screening tool failed to match, again, the uppercase and lowercase letters. So the company's name is SISDOO, and DOO, I understand from Slovenia, is kind of like the same thing as corp or company or LLC, whatever. So they put in the company's name in full caps, and uh, it didn't, and there was no match because they didn't put it in in initial caps. Um, SISDOO. And uh, they they didn't uh, there was no match that occurred because of this, and they did it several they screened it several times, uh, and they made uh, because they had to pay contract fees to this SIS for an app development uh, service, and they collected over one point two million dollars over fifty four months, and uh, in other words, four hundred sixty seven thousand dollars is six seconds of Apple's time. Uh, in terms of revenue. Somebody calculated that, I think, and it, was, it may even be lower now, uh, maybe three seconds, uh, given Apple's continued growth. But nonetheless, showing you again 
the failure of a screening system uh, to catch and the settings and whatever was used with regard to their screening system. One other reminder, uh, we had cobum uh, metallics, which occurred uh, uh, again two years ago. And this was uh, Cobham paid eighty-seven thousand uh, dollars for three violations of OFAX Ukraine Russia sanctions program. They sold software through distributors in Canada to a prohibited SDN. So Cobham was buying Metallics, and uh, during the pre-acquisition due diligence, they identified software sales by uh, Cobham or by Metallics to Almaz and AAT in Russia. And AAT was not lift, listed on OFAX SDN list, but it was 51% owned by a Russian joint stock company, uh, Almazente, JSC Almazente, which was, which was on the uh, SDN list. And the screening software failed to generate a, an alert when they ran it through because the entry omitted the term telecom. And the software that they were using required an all word match. Uh, and so all the words had to match. And even though the search criteria was set to fuzzy, which I still don't understand how that would work with an all word match uh, to detect the partial matches. Uh, but apparently the fuzzy didn't overcome the all word uh, match requirement. And uh, Almaz Ante then was uh, sailed through on the screening system. Again, OFAC said, look, you have to take steps to ensure that your screening software is working correctly and the people know how to use it. Um, and they also, the, these transactions were each approved by the director of trade compliance at the company Metallics, which was eventually bought by Cobham. And uh, they wanted to make sure uh, that um, that people who are using the screening technology know what they're doing, know about the settings, and know how to do it. Well, there's more to it than that, and that was mentioned, and this case is instructive, because what OFAC put out in the sanctions compliance uh, guidance, which occurred in 2019, and is a great document, and it provides really good advice with regard to putting together your program, uh, is there are three requirements if you're going to use an information technology solution, which means screening. And that is, which solution did you consider, and why did you select that company's solution? So if you go through an RFP process, and a lot of people do this, they go through the RFP process and you come up with a, uh, several choices and you pick one particular uh, technology and then you implement it, you, gotta, you should keep documentation as to why you selected that particular solution and what were the reasons that you did, the specific reasons and benefits that you saw. So that's important. Second, calibrations. What settings did you, and you have to document this, what settings did you implement in the screening software? So in other words, did you have an all word match? And if you did, how does that reflect or incorporate, or is it consistent with your risk assessment and risk profile? Obviously it wouldn't have been. An all word match should never be uh, the setting for, for calibrating your program because you want to make sure that you get names that are close to, or you can account for spelling errors in somebody uh, putting in, uh, entering a name and going from there. So you want to make sure that you uh, include that. Routine testing, uh, and we get to the routine testing requirement. How often do you test your solution to ensure that your results are accurate and reliable? And I've recommended that people do a routine test every year, take some known uh, SDNs and uh, put in and enter them into the system, document it, see what the result is, and then go from there. In other words, uh, go through the go. Put in what you know are SDNs. Put in, uh, use some typos in uh, in the spelling. Put down something and then get to the issue of um, whether or not your system is working and then complete the test and then maybe make some changes to some of your calibrations. 
on your uh, risk settings. So this is an important, if you're going to rely upon an information technology solution, you have to make sure it's working and you have to test it. And then around it, around the process, as you, let's say, do a flow chart, you have to have controls in place such that you're not going to have one person conducting the test and then resolving the test if there's a uh, if there's a problem. And as you do technology, as you screen on your day-to-day -day business activities, you have to make sure that you have controls built around the whole system so that you have four eyes looking it over, you have escalation procedures, and you have a way to make sure that it's part of an overall internal control system. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, they require, OFAC requires in their sanctions compliance program. That's what they're looking for in that. In the sanctions compliance uh, guidance that came out from OFAC last year, there was uh, an appendix that included 10 of the most common types of violations that occur. And these 10 violations that occur, one of the most likely occurrences was what they call sanction screening and filter faults. And obviously, OFAC knows that companies are relying on screening software, uh, but they also want to make sure that their screening is done of their customers, your supply chain, your intermediaries, your counterparties, commercial and financial transactions, uh, parties to transactions. So everybody that's involved in a transaction uh, that you have visibility in, you should be basically screening them uh, and then going from there. And what they saw was that companies had failed to update their screening software or had settings that were, um, you know, uh, at, a, at a level that they were going to have problems with regard to the accuracy of their screening. So, for example, though, remember that OFAX SDN and SSI list uh, changes every week or two. They are always adding people, deleting people, and you have to make sure that your screening software is routinely updated by uh, your vendor and uh, that you include the pertinent identifiers like a SWIFT business identifier code or whatever it is uh, that can be helpful in terms of identifying a company and making sure you're talking about the same company. And then we get to our favorite issue of alternative spellings of prohibited parties or countries uh, or you know, addresses, domiciles, locations. Uh, and they, of course, brought out some of their favorite ones, Habana instead of Havana, Cuba with a K instead of with a C, Sudan with an S-O-U instead of Sudan. And you can tell that OFAC has heard about these problems over and over and over again. And OFAC is basically saying through the compliance guidance, we're telling you about this problem. We expect you to deal with it. And it's not a legitimate excuse for why you may end up have ended up dealing with somebody. Uh, so they're putting the onus back on you to and the, and the company to basically assess your technology, make sure it's working okay, and then go from there in terms of annually testing it and documenting every step of the way your screening software, making sure your filters are set or whatever your screening criteria is set at the right way, and then going from there. So this is, uh, this is the point that they, um, Amazon, Apple, there's an American Express case where there was no fine imposed, uh, and I'm going to be posting on my uh, blog this week uh, some of the screening error cases besides uh, that, or sort of going through these uh, screening error cases in even more detail, because this is something, uh, is a risk that we have to avoid, and we'll, we'll have human error type cases where people type in the wrong name or whatever, but it has to be, there has to be sort of a backstop to it, a double check to it. So let's go back then to the cases that occurred. And the most recent case that happened was just recently. And here we have what boils down to a regulatory manager, compliance manager, uh, gave wrong advice with regard to the application of the Iran sanctions program. And uh, in the end, uh, Whitford, uh, which was ultimately, I believe, uh, acquired by PPG, 
uh, had to pay 834000 for violations of the uh, Iran sanctions program. What happened is uh, Whitford's uh, foreign subsidiaries, uh, they engaged in 74 transactions and it was Basically, the regulatory manager advised the business that you can do uh, transactions with Iran uh, through the foreign subsidiaries so long as no U.S. people are involved in the transactions or the U.S. company isn't involved. Uh, But what happened is actually U.S. people were ultimately involved because they directed the transactions or had to sign off on some of them. But the regulatory manager's advice was incorrect. Um, in that at the time, whether or not you could conduct business with Iran through a third party. And uh, the, in 2012, the Iran sanctions program, were, the application was expanded to include uh, any subsidiary or any foreign operation that's controlled or uh, owned by a U.S. company. And uh, the regulatory manager didn't understand that, didn't bother to look at the regulations or didn't seek advice uh, you know, from a lawyer or from somebody with expertise in this area. Apparently, the regulatory manager was not the trade compliance manager, but provided this uh, this uh, advice. So they, you know, are happily going along there for a few years, 2013, I think, to 16. And then in 16, when there was the relaxation of the uh, Iran sanctions program, OFAC issued a general license H, if you remember this, to allow foreign subsidiaries uh, to engage in uh, dealings with Iran. And suddenly, uh, Whitford started to scratch the top of his head and said, hmm, I wonder why we need a general license H. I thought this was legal. Well, they then consulted with outside counsel, and then outside counsel told them, no, you can't, you shouldn't have been doing this, and therefore let's pull together what we know and then do a voluntary disclosure. So that's what happened in the Whitford case. This was the last case that just came out from OFAC about uh, last week. And uh, lo and behold, here we go. Um, The Iran sanctions uh, again continue to be uh, pretty much the focus of. Uh, OFAC's activities. And so we also saw another legal advice error in another case that was earlier in the year, and this was pre sort of the pandemic really hitting, and that was called the Biomin case. And here, uh, Bi- uh, Biomin agreed to pay OFAC 257000 uh, for violations of the Cuba sanctions program. Now, remember, Iran and Cuba sanctions programs are the most aggressive in terms of applying to foreign operations and subsidiaries. So uh, uh, basically, OFAC has pushed it to the limit in terms of how far they can go uh, in terms of jurisdiction. And um, uh, so here we had a case where there was $17 million in sales to a Cuban uh, company, um, and what was interesting is that OFAC, uh, because they were basically providing some uh, humanitarian type goods um, and that could have probably been um, licensed. And OFAC suggested that had Biomen sought a license, they may have gotten a specific license uh, to engage in the transactions. Nonetheless, what Biomen decided to do is, well, we'll just use our foreign subsidiaries to sell to Cuba. Uh, even though we have some U.S. personnel that are here directing it, but we'll just, if we do it through a foreign subsidiary, it should be okay. And that was another internal legal advice error. And I, I just want to reiterate, not to drum up business, but some of these issues, there's a lot of precedent or there's a lot of interpretation of the regulations. Um, and before you uh, you know, rely on one person's resolution in the company, make sure you get other, uh, some lawyers to look at it. Internal lawyers are fine, uh, but somebody with trade compliance experience who follows these kinds of issues, because that's clearly what happened uh, in this case. And uh, the transactions um, were obviously in violation of the Cuban uh, sanctions program. We had another interesting, and the, the biggest case actually financially was a uh, Swiss telecom company, CIDA, 
and it provides telecom services to all the civil aviation companies. It's kind of like a consolidated uh, service that's uh, it's like a membership organization for um, uh, aviation companies. And here we had a violation of the global terrorism sanctions, uh, over 9,000 violations, uh, and they ended up paying $7.8 million. So they provided uh, the services to several prohibited government airline companies like the Airline of Sudan, the national airlines that uh, had been designated uh, in various uh, prohibited countries, and they were providing services through this consortium. Uh, but they knew that the consortium included these prohibited companies, but they nonetheless went forward with it. They knew they were violating the sanctions uh, program. They, uh, but then what was interesting, and there are two really important points to this case, at least in my mind, was they conducted uh, it. They found out, OFAC found out that CIDA uh, had conducted a risk assessment. And so they said, okay, let's see the risk assessment. We want to you know, review that as well as part of our uh, investigation. And it turned out they did a risk assessment without looking at um, sanctions risks. In other words, they looked at all the regulatory uh, risks that were faced, but they decided to avoid looking at sanctions risks. And I wonder who was involved in that and why that came about. I'm sure that troubled OFAC, and that's why we have a pretty high settlement. The second point here was um, that one of the ways that they got jurisdiction uh, over this case, uh, because when you hear about it, it's a Swiss company providing a consortium, providing telecom services that used uh, by civil aviation companies, and let's say involving countries that were prohibited by the U.S. Uh, but nonetheless, how did we get jurisdiction? Well, interestingly, some of the tra some of the services were actually transited through the United States, but m more importantly and more interesting is that some of the services were delivered using uh, U.S. origin software. So the question, and I have gotten this question before uh, from clients and colleagues, is if we're using, let's say, a Microsoft service in the cloud but it's U.S. origin software, uh, and it's all outside the United States, do we run the risk of sanctions enforcement? Uh, a very interesting question. And CIDA, I think, gives us a situation where not only does U.S. origin software, depending upon the amount of it, uh, but also uh, services that transit through the U.S. So the telecom system services at some point came through the United States uh, circuits or whatever. And uh, it, even those two aspects provided the, um, uh, the uh, jurisdiction for OFAC to uh, get involved in this case. Interesting, interesting result, but raises more issues for us when we think about uh, these jurisdictional hooks that OFAC can use. Um, we have a few more cases, and uh, Eagle Shipping. Uh, Eagle Shipping paid uh, $1.17 million for violations of the Burmese sanctions program, which is no longer applicable. Uh, and when this enforcement action happened, uh, obviously those sanctions have been lifted, but they have not been lifted with regard to SDNs that may be in Myanmar or Burma. And um, there actually are a lot of prohibited SDNs in Burma, so you have to be careful because the economy there is controlled by a small group of people who ultimately, many of whom are SDNs. And we've had situations where uh, people have been unable to complete deals uh, in Myanmar because of that. Um, there also are a lot of... Uh, you know, confusing structural setups from Burma uh, to try to disguise SDNs uh, as well. But here, Eagle provided shipping services uh, for, uh, they were uh, transporting some kind of sand or something like that. Um, and uh, the they knew that they were dealing with a SDN and uh, they altered the bill of lading and other documents to take that person's name out of it. Uh, they also, what was interesting was 
during, after they did that, they tried to obtain a license from OFAC for subsequent shipments and the application was denied. So now they knew that they were uh, violating uh, OFAC because OFAC denied the license applications, but nonetheless, uh, they continued forward. Uh, I think it was uh, three or four transactions altogether or shipments uh, in Eagle Shipping uh, went through uh, bankruptcy and there was like ownership changes. So in the end, uh, they ended up paying $1.17 million uh, for these uh, violations. Okay, let's go to the last case, which is uh, a reminder for all us lawyers and compliance practitioners uh, that OFAC actually can apply uh, to service providers. Uh, forensic accountants, I would think, uh, should be careful here um, in terms and lobbyists because Park Strategies is a simple uh, U.S. lobbying firm based in New York. Uh, and... Um, they they basically received, not they paid, $12,000 for providing uh, services to a foreign designated terrorist from Somalia. Now, there is a general license which basically permits legal and compliance services. And to the extent forensic accountants are involved in that, uh, you should make sure that you operate within uh the either legal or compliance services contract. In other words, make sure that they retain you and you report to them for purposes of providing services. And it was a 30,000 engagement uh, for lobbying services. And the uh, OFAC said, hey, sorry, the lobbying services fall outside legal and compliance services. So you got to make sure here that if you're providing services or advising a, somebody who's on the list, uh, that you do so. Now, another way that can come up is people who sometimes get put on the SDN list will try to get off and ask you to help them uh, to try to get off. So uh, a couple points here on OFAC enforcement, just to reiterate, remember foreign company operations don't insulate liability, screening errors and your technology are your problems. Remember risk assessments should include sanctions risks. Know your distribution chain and know your supply chains. It's really, unfortunately, pretty burdensome. And uh, find out your beneficial owners for your shell companies. Before we leave, I wanted to just there just update everybody on the uh, Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security Actions. Uh, and they're targeting recently of Chinese companies. Beyond uh, Huawei, uh, we now have... Uh, Chinese companies that have been designated for human rights violations, and they're on the designated entity list. Um, and there's restrictions then on access for these companies uh, for U.S. origin items, including commodities and technology. Uh, there's an advisory on supply chain risks for these companies. Uh, and we're going to look to uh, more requirements being imposed, I think, in the, based on the uh, controversy in Hong Kong. This, uh, the, the companies that were designated here are those companies connected to the repression against the, the Muslim minority groups uh, in Zwaur. I'm not going to try to say, uh, pronounce the autonomous region. But remember, this is going on. Make sure that we're not dealing, if you're dealing with Chinese companies, re, uh, hopefully make sure that these uh, folks are not on it. Um, it's pretty much a prohibition, even though they're on the entity list at this point. With regard to Huawei, uh, basically, there are new licensing requirements. There's a temporary general license right now for Huawei. Uh, that's going to be, that's going to expire. They've been extending it for 90 days at a time, but it's going to expire in August 2020. Uh, given our, you know, poor relations right now, uh, it's going to expire later this month. Um, I'm sure it'll probably get extended for another 90 days, but watch out over this. Um, and Commerce has been uh, telling people, find somebody else besides Huawei to deal with uh, in terms of the licensing requirements. So these are important issues uh, to, for you all to, uh, to stay on top of. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a little bit with re time with regard to questions, if you have any, because we have a little bit more time. Uh, I'm also going to run our poll question, uh, which is, would you like, uh, like me to get in contact with you so that we can help you? Uh, 
with regard to uh, sanctions compliance. We do risk assessments. We've been doing supply chain audits uh, and other things that uh, hopefully uh, can help you with regard to maintaining your uh, compliance. Um, we also have helped people with implementing uh, technologies uh, and making sure you have the controls uh, that are around them. But if you uh, if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Um, uh, um, if you have any other questions, a good question came in, which was outside of the general expectation that we utilize fuzzy logic in our scanning, the Apple case and Amazon case, are we aware of any published items from OFAC that discuss uh, fuzzy logic and scanning expectations? No, uh, I'm not. Uh, we're not. See, I haven't seen much other. There are four cases that really dealt with, with this, the Metallics case, American Express, which I didn't go through. Uh, I'm going to be posting on it this week on this issue. Uh, and then we have the statement and the sanctions uh, compliance uh, guidance and, and the annex. But uh, what's really clear is that however you calibrate your program, make sure that it, it is somewhat related to your risk assessment. Uh, in other words, making sure that your high-risk candidates are uh, pretty liberally screened. In other words, loose, more loose than other types of uh, areas, uh, you know, other types of customers. Um, any other questions? Uh, um, are the vendors or methods used for searching disclosed anywhere? No, they really aren't. Uh, it would be a good thing to, uh, to have uh, is that. When we look at alternative spellings for names and countries, have we seen any indication that OFAC wants that on every information element, city name and street, rather than the big ones like the name only and country. Yes, that's definitely true, because a lot of times the SDNs have addresses uh, that are included in the SDN designation. So we want to make sure that uh, we include the addresses and make sure that they're accurate to ensure that we uh, actually get to that point. Uh, so that's that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, the other thing that Amazon did, which I thought was interesting in their remediation, and if you read the case, is they also um, started to, they updated and uh, said they were going to keep current their IP address ranges, prohibited ranges for uh, countries that are prohibited. In other words, uh, apparently from the IP address, you can get, uh, it obviously has a country part of it, and uh, they were updating the prohibited parts of the IP addresses uh, to make sure that they were captured in the search um, of the uh, entity. So I thought that was uh, an interesting aspect uh, to, to this uh, as well. Um, okay. Um, uh, are there AES filing requirements for OFAC general license shipments to Iran or other sanctioned countries? If it's covered by a general license in general, uh, you're not going to have an AES filing requirement, but you should double check it because it depends on the product. There are types where uh, there are cases where that does uh, where that does occur. Um, where do you see U.S. sanctions against Russia developing? I think uh, the U.S. sanctions uh, are going to increase. Uh, I think if there's a change in administration, if uh, the Biden wins the election, I think they're going to ramp those up even more. Uh, and I think we're going to see more uh, enforcement with regard to that. Um, okay. Um, well, let's. Uh, I want to thank everybody again. If I didn't get to your question, um, I will try to write you and uh, respond to the specific question. But uh, we're also. I wanted to let everybody know we're going to have a webinar on uh, a week and a day from today uh, from Compliance Line. We just posted it. Uh, Compliance Line is a new uh, sponsor. They're involved in hotlines, um, and we're going to have a. Uh, webinar on uh, next Wednesday, same time on employee engagement, uh, employee reporting systems. So hope you can make that 
uh, as well. Thank you again for uh, attending. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay in contact, uh, and I hope everything uh, goes well for you uh, in the future. But thank you again, uh, and uh, stay in touch. Please do.